Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. The French Revolution set Europe ablaze. It was an age of enlightenment and progress, but also of tyranny and oppression. It was an age of glory and an age of tragedy. One man stood above it all. This was the age of Napoleon. I'm Everett Rummage, host of the Age of Napoleon podcast. Join me as I examine the life and times of one of the most fascinating and enigmatic characters in modern history. Look for the Age of Napoleon wherever you find your podcasts. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 3, Episode 10. A crowning mercy, the final battle of Worcester. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. I'm your host, Samuel Hume. Before we begin, I have to thank the new additions to the House of Lords. Jonathan Williams, Duke of Newcastle, Nicholas Dean, Marquess of Berkeley, Thomas Burridge, Earl of Strafford. Like all other patrons, they can now listen to this episode and every other episode ad-free. All three of these new peers can also listen to the bonus content. Go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica to find out more. I just released the second episode in our History of the Mughal Empire series. The first emperor, Babur, is poised to descend through the Khyber Pass and establish that empire, and patrons of Earl and above can listen. Last time, we heard how Oliver Cromwell's invasion of Scotland didn't start well. Scottish Covenanter General David Leslie pulled his forces back to a defensive line between Edinburgh and Leith, stripping the land between it and the English border of food and supplies. Cromwell's total dominance of the sea allowed supplies to be ferried to his army, while the English fleet bombarded the Scottish positions, but try as he might, he could not bait Leslie out from behind the lines. After weeks of manoeuvring, and losing thousands of men to skirmishes, disease and desertion, Cromwell accepted defeat, and began his withdrawal. The invasion of Scotland had failed, and the English army wanted to get back across the border before the weather really got bad. But Leslie was not content to let Cromwell simply march away. He followed the English army to the port of Dunbar, where Cromwell had his sick and wounded embarked for taking home. Leslie understood that allowing a withdrawal would not end the war. The new model army had to be defeated, either in battle or by surrendering. Either because he gave in to the demands of the zealous covenanters around him, eager to see God's judgment dramatically executed, or because he intended to more firmly cut off the English from escape, Leslie led his army off his vantage point. But over the following night, Cromwell moved his army into position, either attempting to break through Leslie's cordon in order to escape, or, as he would later tell it, because he believed his army could take on the Scots. After a startlingly successful cavalry charge scattered Leslie's own cavalry, the new model army rolled up the Scottish line. At Dunbar, the outnumbered English army handily defeated the larger Scottish one. There's a reason Dunbar was often called the Miracle of Dunbar, or, to Scots, Cursed Dunbar. We left off with the Scots reacting to this surprising and sudden turnabout. Leslie withdrew what was left of his army back to Stirling, abandoning the defences of Edinburgh and Leith, and this meant that the Scottish government had to follow suit. Cromwell simply marched into the undefended Scottish capital, setting up a siege of Edinburgh Castle, which remained garrisoned. His troops settled in for some well-earned rest, a few took pot shots at the decapitated head of the Marquis of Montrose, which had been put on a spike in Edinburgh after his execution last episode. A few of them hit it, but it would remain stubbornly on the spike. Cromwell sent for reinforcements from England, 
and he received more than 6,000 over the next two months. He also reopened his lines of communication with both the Scottish civilian government as well as the Kirk. The Committee of Estates, now in Stirling, was not receptive to his diplomacy, but he had more progress with the General Assembly of the Kirk. The Western Association, a network of counties including Ayrshire and Kirkcubri, declared that they would not fight for Charles II. Meanwhile, Cromwell attempted to press his advantage. Just a week after taking Edinburgh, he began his advance on Stirling. As Stuart Reid puts it, Cromwell had bitten off more than he could chew. The weather and the determined resistance of the Scots defeated a feeble attempt at storming Stirling's walls. The English withdrew back to Linlithgow, establishing a strong position at its bridge over the River Avon, and Cromwell took the rest of his army back to Edinburgh to wait out the winter. Edinburgh Castle surrendered on the 23rd of December. This all had political repercussions. For starters, the Kirk Party was heavily discredited by the defeat at Dunbar, and their reduced influence was made worse by the fact that many of the radicals took refuge in Edinburgh Castle instead of following Leslie to Stirling. This meant that once the English turned up and put them to siege, they were effectively silenced. Archibald Strachan, another radical and the defeater of Montrose, abandoned Leslie and instead went west to raise another army which refused to fight for the king. This all meant that the grip of the Kirk party over the direction of the war was now diluted and allowed the young Charles II to play a greater role. As we saw last time, when they invited Charles II back to Scotland, the Kirk party was determined to keep him firmly under control. He was, by his very nature, dangerous to their dominance of Scotland's government. When he was welcomed by the people of Edinburgh with partying, it scared them. When he visited the defences at Leith and was greeted with cheers by the soldiers, it terrified them. When Charles requested that the northern levies be assembled at Stirling, the Kirk party refused this suggestion, on the grounds that it was a transparent attempt to claim an army of his own. After Dunbar, and possibly from the justifiable fear that he was about to be kidnapped by more radical members of the Scottish army, Charles fled Dunfermline and went to Perth. This led to the Kirk party, stung by Dunbar, to order another purge of Charles's household. Anyone who was leading the king astray, putting ideas in his young head that were contrary to the covenants he had signed, would be removed. This latest purge was Charles's limit. He now followed in his father's footsteps and began to plot a coup. The Earl of Athol, who was loyal to him, surreptitiously brought men to Perth, and the plan was to wait for the Kirk commissioners to arrive to carry out the purge, and then arrest them. Charles kept this plan between him and his Scottish supporters, but at the last minute he told his English companions, which included the new Duke of Buckingham, and they freaked out. It was too dangerous, they said, and it might spark a civil war. Charles was now, also following in his father's footsteps, racked by indecision. He cancelled the plot, and then changed his mind and told it to go ahead, and then he panicked and ran away. No one really knew what to do, so the royalist uprising inside and outside Perth still went ahead, but there was no one to lead it. Their king had run away. The Committee of Estates sent word for the king, who had taken refuge in Glencova, and urged him to come back, which, surprisingly, he did. Because despite the blatant distrust and hostility between king and covenanter, both factions knew that they needed the other, and that a civil war in the north of Scotland, while the English occupied the south, would be disastrous for both of them. Both sides tried to damp down the embers of civil war. A limited amnesty for the uprising was soon extended when government forces failed to suppress it and others began switching sides. Charles sent word to his loyal followers to put down arms and come back to the table. A treaty was signed at Strathbogie on the 4th of November. Charles was now welcomed onto the Committee of Estates, part of government, not excluded from it. Barry Robertson argues that this was an astounding moment because, quote, the king himself had abandoned the royalist cause and had now committed himself in formal and practical terms to promoting the cause of the covenants throughout the three kingdoms, end quote. In the West, the Western Association forces were gathering under the command of Archibald Strachan and Gibby Kerr, 
they sent word to Leslie that he shouldn't, quote, trouble them with any of his orders, end quote. They were a wild card force, aligned with neither the English or the King. On the 17th of October, they published the Western Remonstrance, which railed against the moderation of the Committee of Estates, and called for the Act of Classes, which had expelled royalists and engagers from political and military office, to be fully enforced again. Another remonstrance was published two weeks later, after the Committee of Estates essentially just ignored the first one. The remonstrance, as we'll call them, were not entirely opposed to an alliance with the invading English. As they saw it, the king was their greatest enemy, not the English, who were more aligned to their view of the true church. They weren't perfect, of course, nothing but the true Scottish Kirk was, and the new Republican English were worryingly independent, and were far too tolerant of different strains of Protestantism. But that could be worked on, and so correspondence between Cromwell, Strachan, and Kerr was taking place before and after Dunbar, and it's possible that a formal alliance could have been established. Unfortunately for the Remonstrants, the perfect time for a link-up, October, when the Committee of Estates was dealing with Charles in the North, Cromwell was hampered by moss troopers, scattered survivors of Dunbar, who harassed his supply lines and communications, and were generally a nuisance. They took time to suppress, and when Cromwell and John Lambert were ready to commit to the Remonstrants, the Remonstrants had given up on the English, Strachan, who had been the biggest supporter of an English alliance, was forced out of favour, but not command. The remonstrance now demanded that Cromwell withdraw from Scotland and leave them in control. But Cromwell refused. Perhaps he thought history was repeating itself. He'd left the radical Kirk party in control after the Second English Civil War, and now here he was again, invading Scotland to remove a government aligned with the House of Stuart. Without an alliance, settling who dominated southern Scotland would be settled with violence. A confusing series of events then played out around the town of Hamilton on the 1st of December 1650, where Lambert and Kerr, now in command of the Remonstrant Force, fought a chaotic night battle. Neither was where the other expected them to be, the fighting went back and forth, at one point Lambert was captured but escaped through the back door of an inn, it was a mess. By the end of the battle, the Remonstrant army was no longer an effective fighting force. This also led to a rebalance of Scotland's politics once again. With the hardliners effectively neutralised by the Battle of Hamilton, the moderate Covenanters, now called Resolutioners, because we need more faction names, tied the knot with the King. On New Year's Day 1651, Charles II was crowned at the traditional site of Schoon. Other than the location, it was not a traditional coronation. Instead of a church minister or a bishop, the Marquis of Argyll and the Earl of Loudoun placed the crown on the king's head. The sermon which accompanied the ceremony was two hours long and railed against the actions of the new king's father and reminded all present, including the king, that Scotland's king must defend the true Kirk and the Covenants. This included accepting the Scottish Revolution and rejecting absolutism. In Charles's coronation oath, he swore to do just that. Then, once the ceremony was complete, the honours of Scotland, the crown, scepter and sword, were not returned to Edinburgh Castle because it was currently under English occupation. Instead, later in 1651, they were smuggled to Donotta Castle, the seat of the Earl Marshal, for safekeeping. We'll cover the rest of that story another time. Charles hated this coronation. He absolutely despised it. He'd hold a special hatred for the men involved, particularly Argyle, for the rest of his, or at least their, lives. But it did what it was meant to do. It rallied the kingdom behind the king. It helped paper over old rivalries and assured royalists that if they fought for Scotland, they would also be fighting for their king. The oaths Charles had taken also assured Covenanters that if they fought for the king, they were also fighting for their church. Combined with the presence of a foreign invader on Scottish soil, the Resolutioners could count on something approaching unity.
The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half and the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy. Madame Tussaud. We all know the name, and many of us have visited one of the wax museums which bear that name. But you may not realize the historical significance of the woman behind the name or how she and her waxworks defined the genre of true crime. If that has piqued your interest, then give The Art of Crime a listen. The Art of Crime is a history podcast by Gavin Whitehead, a historian of Victorian theatre, all about the unlikely collisions between true crime and the arts. If you enjoy the detail of Pax Britannica, then you'll love The Art of Crime. The latest season of The Art of Crime tells two stories. First, it chronicles Tussaud's career, starting in pre-revolutionary France, and ending in Victorian London. Second, it tracks the evolution of the Chamber of Horrors, a showroom in her wax museum that exhibited macabre curiosities, including effigies of notorious criminals. You'll hear how Toussaint won patronage from the French royal family, narrowly escaped the guillotine during the Reign of Terror, and became one of the most celebrated showwomen in Paris and London. This season also covers the most divisive assassin of the French Revolution, the last man to be hung, drawn, and quartered for high treason in England, and the glamorous murderer who attained notoriety as a modern Lady Macbeth. Subscribe to The Art of Crime wherever you get your podcasts. Throughout the winter of 1650 to 1651, Cromwell was preparing for a very bold manoeuvre. Stirling Castle was not an easy nut to crack, and simply marching past it wasn't a sensible decision. From his position at Edinburgh, he could see right across the fir for Forth to Fife, and perhaps this gave him the idea. He sent word to the Council of State. He wanted assault boats built at Newcastle and sent to Edinburgh. But amphibious assaults are always a risk, and so Cromwell still hoped that he could lure Leslie out of his defences. It had happened the previous year, after all, although that had been by accident. In June 1651, he marched his army towards Stirling, and when this got no response, he tried again in July by marching towards Glasgow. Leslie didn't take the bait, but these moves did more than just keep his men exercised. Cromwell's manoeuvres kept Leslie's attention firmly on land. So when, on the 17th of July, 1,400 men crossed the water and landed at North Queen's Ferry, Leslie couldn't react in time. Within days, 4,500 men were on the other side of the Firth of Forth. Lambert's force, for he was in command, landed and established itself on the small peninsula where the Forth Bridge makes landfall in the modern day. The peninsula narrows before it reaches the mainland, and here waited 4,000 Scots under Sir John Brown. Neither side wanted to make the first move. Lambert was still waiting for more men and Brown was in a defensible position with trenches. After waiting for some time, Brown decided to move his army back onto higher ground on Castland Hill to the west of Inverkeithing. Lambert saw this and decided to seize the initiative. He rushed his forces into battle with the Scottish rearguard, taking the narrow isthmus of the peninsula, and then dug in themselves, expecting a counterattack. Instead, the same waiting game played out for an hour and a half. Brown was now on high ground and didn't want to lose it, and Lambert now had a defensive position of his own. But time was working in the Scots' favour, and Lambert soon received intelligence from Cromwell that Leslie was sending Brown reinforcements. Lambert had to attack now, or else, at best, he'd be pinned up in North Queen's Ferry, like the Earl of Essex at Loswithiel, forced to surrender. At worst, his army would be pinned against the Forth 
and utterly destroyed. The attack uphill into a prepared position against forces which seemed to have slightly outnumbered them was a success. Lambert's cavalry on his left was broken by Scottish horsemen, but the English cavalry on the right, and especially the English infantry in the centre, were unbroken. The Scots lacked a reserve to capitalise on the defeat of the English cavalry left wing, and the tide soon turned. Over a four-hour battle, 2,000 Scots were killed, hundreds were taken prisoner, including Brown, and the English foothold in Fife was secured. Over the following days, Cromwell withdrew his army back towards Edinburgh. He'd been threatening Stirling to keep Leslie under pressure, and crossed most of it over to the bridgehead. Dunbar had been the turning point of the invasion. The Battle of Inverkeithing effectively won it. Once Cromwell was in Fife, he quickly marched to the city of Perth and, after a short and bloodless siege, accepted its surrender. The English now controlled the main route from Stirling to the rest of Scotland. The balance of power within the Scottish government and army now firmly rested with Charles and the Royalists, or National Monarchists, to borrow from Robertson. The prospect of fighting off the invasion now looked bleak. With supplies and reinforcements from the borders or the north blocked by English forces, who were about to capture Perth, and the loyalty of the west unreliable after the remonstrance asserted control, Charles convinced those around him that the best chance they had was to march south. Not to Edinburgh, as Cromwell expected him to, but into England, to London. The army set out from Stirling on the 31st of July, 1651. The fact that this strategy was taken displays exactly how dire the situation now was for Scotland. Those around the king fully understood that the chances of this counter-invasion working were slim. Many of them wrote to friends and family, admitting these feelings, which were of course intercepted by Republican spies, who were not thrilled to learn that a Scottish invasion was imminent, but were thrilled to find out that few of the invaders thought they were going to win. But the strategy was based on something, as shaky as it might have been. The popularity of the revolutionary republican regime in England was doubted. It was costing a fortune to maintain the army in Scotland, as well as the army in Ireland, and this was after years of skyrocketing parliamentary taxation. There were hopes at Charles's court that resentment would spark rebellion once the rightful King of England arrived on its soil, but for Charles there was a more personal reason. He had grown to despise Scotland, as represented by the harsh Presbyterian demands which had been increasingly made upon him since before he'd even arrived. Much like the last Scottish invasion of England under the Engagers, this invasion did not start well. The army was between 14,000 and 20,000 strong when it left its barracks at Stirling, by the time it reached the Anglo-Scottish border, it was closer to 12 or 13,000. From the wide gap in those numbers, you can probably tell that our sources are not indisputable, but what is clear is that desertion was epidemic in the army. Which isn't really a surprise. A defensive war to protect against invasion was one thing. Counterattacking with an invasion of your own, with the target being the other end of Great Britain, with morale in the toilet, after a year of campaigning, a succession of defeats, while half your country was still under occupation, after multiple political splits against the backdrop of religious schism, that was quite another. Charles crossed the border on the 6th of August, crossing near Carlisle, much as Hamilton had done during the last invasion. But unlike Hamilton, he made good time. Within a week, he reached Warrington, between Liverpool and Manchester, and a good hundred miles or so from Scotland. A few days after that, he reached Worcester, jewel of the Midlands, and took stock. Other than his speed, which was impressive, the campaign had not gone well. For starters, England had not risen for him. Much like with the Engagers, the people of England were back to seeing the Scots as invaders, not the liberators of the Bishops' Wars, or even the early Civil War. Worse, Charles had publicly stated his intention to keep to the Covenants and establish Presbyterianism in England. He'd wriggle out of it if he could, but he'd had to say it to keep his Scottish allies, 
and this did nothing to encourage English support. The Committee of Estates, well prepared for his arrival, had acted quickly to suppress any planned unrest. Their intelligence network was still very effective, and a conspiracy to aid the king was cracked in March. An uprising in Lancashire, aided by the return of the Earl of Derby from the Isle of Man, would coincide with dissidents in London, apprentices and Presbyterian ministers among them. The Lancashire uprising would welcome the Scots, whoever happened to be in power at the time, and the London dissidents would restore the MPs excluded from power since Pride's purge. Then, Charles would be offered the same terms as the Newport Treaty, which his father had so nearly accepted. Once this conspiracy was broken, the Republic cracked down and smothered it. The Earl of Derby and Stanlock Moore, the great Stanley himself, arrived back in England on the 15th of August, and met with Charles on the 17th. He had held the Isle of Man as one of the few unbroken holdouts of royalism, biding his time. But now he returned to his king's side, to be told to raise a thousand men from Lancashire. He tried, but he was fairly quickly defeated in a small battle at Wigan, and returned to Charles empty-handed the day before the Battle of Worcester. At Worcester, Charles settled in. He ordered the ancient Roman walls to be repaired, and a posse comitatus, a militia, summoned, of which about a thousand men were rounded up. But he didn't have long to catch his breath. Cromwell was leading the main army south on the faster eastern road, while both Lambert and Colonel Harrison had been harassing his march all the way, keeping him from easily turning east towards his intended target of London. The militias of the counties he'd passed through remained firmly on the Republic's side, and they'd been obstacles, slowing him down and shepherding him west as well. It seems like Charles only stopped at Worcester out of necessity. More than 20 days of marching in hostile territory, undersupplied, underpaid, underfed, demoralised, many of his men simply stopped and refused to go any further. His chance to move was firmly closed when Cromwell appeared on the horizon on the 28th of August. Cromwell arrived at Worcester from the southeast with nearly 30,000 men. Charles Stuart had less than half that number, and they were not in a great state. But the future king had not given up hope. The geography of Worcester was part of his strategy. Most of Worcester, then and now, sits on the east bank of the River Severn with St. John's on the west bank. South of St. John's is the smaller River Team, with a bridge at the village of Powick. Charles ordered the bridges north and south of the city to be destroyed. Unfortunately, Cromwell was faster. He ordered Lambert to the southern bridge at Upton to seize it before it was fully destroyed. Lambert got there just in time, as it was almost uncrossable, and after fierce fighting, the bridge was secured and Lambert set about repairing it. Meanwhile, Cromwell's main force sat on the east bank of the Severn, facing the walls of Worcester. This delay was providential for Cromwell, because it allowed him to plan the attack to take place on the 3rd of September, the anniversary of the Miracle of Dunbar. On that morning, the last battle of the Wars of the Three Kingdoms began. With the crossing at Upton secure, Charles Fleetwood marched 11,000 men over it and began to move back north towards Worcester. His route north was blocked by the team, and the only crossing was the Powick Bridge, defended by two brigades. At Powick Bridge, the Royalists put up another fierce fight. If Powick Bridge rings a bell, that might be because this was the site of Prince Rupert of the Rhine's victory in 1642, the first battle of the English Civil War. In the fierce fighting that followed over Powick Bridge, the second part of Cromwell's plan took place. Fleetwood had been delayed marching north, and the reason was now revealed. Because a detachment of a thousand men marched right to where the team flows into the Severn, and two prepared pontoon bridges were thrown across the waters. At a stroke, Parliament's divided army was now reunited, and their greater numbers would take their toll removing one of the major advantages of Charles's strategy. Cromwell himself now led reinforcements west across the Severn and then north across the team, and now he outflanked the defenders of Powick Bridge. 
Their choke point now useless, the Royalists had to fall back, and they took up positions along the hedgerows and ditches south of St John's. The fighting went lane by lane, field by field, and Cromwell soon called on Lambert to send more men over the pontoon bridges. Though the terrain helped the Scottish infantry defend their positions, it hampered cavalry on both sides, and without cavalry support, the Royalists were slowly pushed back by weight of numbers. With both Royalists and Republicans committed on the West Bank, Charles personally led an offensive against Colonel Harrison's forces, which occupied Red Hills, high ground east of Worcester. The cavalry charge, supported by a force of Highlanders, led to an extended three-hour fight. By the end, Royalists held Red Hill and occupied a position in the nearby Perry Wood. It was an achievement won through massive effort. The Scots resorted to bashing in English heads with the butts of their muskets once they ran out of ammunition, but the tide soon turned, because Cromwell reacted. He crossed back over the pontoon bridges, bringing his reserves and the reinforcements sent by Lambert with him. He crossed to the south of the Royalist position and began marching north towards Red Hill, while he sent cavalry east to go around Red Hill and rally the men who had fallen back. These men marched back up the hill, engaged the Royalists from the east, and then Cromwell's main force attacked them from the south in the flank. Stuart Reed lays most of the blame for this on David Leslie. Leslie was in charge of a force of cavalry positioned to the north of Worcester, but Reed paints a picture of an officer facing a crisis of confidence. To Reed, Leslie was one of those officers who was great at commanding small forces, but struggled to lead large armies, hence why he liked to keep them stationary behind defences like at Leith or at Stirling, and cursed Dunbar had shattered his confidence. Not only did he now doubt his own capability to make decisions, he didn't believe the invasion of England was going to work. So even as he watched Cromwell break off from the fighting at St John's, cross the bridges, and move on the King's new position at Red Hill, he didn't try to intercept him. With Cromwell's flanking manoeuvre, the Royalist position collapsed. Charles attempted desperately to rally his men, and he put his life in serious danger trying to do so, but the demoralised army, mostly exhausted Scots, but also inexperienced English levies, would not hold. They fell back into Worcester, and the defences of the walls and Fort Royal. By now, the sun was setting, but Cromwell was determined not to let this become a siege. With the Royalists on the back foot, his army assaulted Fort Royal and one of the eastern gates, and after three hours, the fort fell. The artillery within was then turned around and fired at the Royalists within the city. On the west bank of the Severn, Fleetwood's men had pushed their way through St John's and to the bridge and gate of St Clement's, and then forced their way into the city. With breaches both west and east, vicious street fighting followed, as many Scots refused to surrender. By 8pm, though, the fighting was mostly over, and the surviving Royalist defenders moved in two general directions. North, to St Martin's Gate and escape from the city, and south to the ruins of the old castle, which was still a very defensible position. The defenders of Castle Mount, as it was called, were dug in by the time Cromwell arrived on the scene, and to avoid any more fighting, Cromwell agreed to terms of surrender. These prisoners, along with thousands of others, were herded into Worcester Cathedral. I have to wonder whether any of these royalists, many of them very far from home, looked at the tomb of King John of Magna Carta fame and pondered the wisdom of following kings. More likely, the exhausted soldiers probably just sat on it for some well-deserved rest. Some royalists escaped, but the army itself was destroyed. The Battle of Worcester effectively ended the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. Falling on the same date as Dunbar, and being such an incredibly one-sided, conclusive victory, it appeared to be a clear sign of divine providence. Cromwell, in his report to Parliament, called it a crowning mercy. There was still fighting in all three kingdoms, especially as Scottish survivors were hunted down throughout the English Midlands, but England, Parliamentarian, Republican England, was the undisputed winner of the Wars of the Three Kingdoms its dominance over the other nations of the former Stuart monarchy was complete, and one man, 
a formerly obscure MP of middling status, was now the most powerful man in the Commonwealth. But what about Charles? Well, the story of Charles' escape from Worcester is a tale all on its own, and one he was never tired of telling. Thank you to my House of Lords, including but not limited to the King's favourite, Mike Sanders, the Duchess of Wellington, Sue Bremner, Steve Pinko, Marquess of Hull, and Brennan Sherry, Earl of Widdicombe. Go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica to join their ranks and listen to the podcast without ads. Patrons of Earl and above also get access to the bonus content. Remember that you can join the mailing list to get news about the show by going to the link in the description. For other great podcasts on the Airwave Network, check out airwavemedia.com. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy.